Well, I knew we were going to have kids in were here with us today, and so I hope you enjoyed uh, our cartoon illustration of the first 19 books of uh, Exodus. It's uh, kind of a TED Talk for kids, and there, there's one for a lot of different parts of the New Testament and the Old Testament. And so uh, we'll be picking these up from time to time. Today I want us to be in the book of Exodus. And I wanted to tell you about a kid who was trying to decide. He wanted, when he grew up, he wanted to have a son that he would name whose name would be in bright lights everywhere they went. So what do you think he said he would name his son? Moses? Good guess. But the answer is exit. Exit. He thought, well, if I have exit in my son's name, it'll be bright lights everywhere. You won't be able to go anywhere without seeing my son's name in lights. Exit is exodus. It's the word. It means departure. And it's the, where we pick up in this second book uh, of the Bible. The exodus, we cannot underestimate its importance to the story or to Israel. Because the Exodus and the Passover is to Israel what the 4th of July is to us, what Bastille Day is in France, what the Magna Carta is to the British. This is the moment that defines God's people. The Exodus and the Passover story. And so what we're looking at today is critical to understanding all that will come after it. We date this story somewhere around 1530 with the birth of Moses and we will come and end our story today in 1446 with uh, Exodus and the Red Sea. But I wanted us to see that we've moved from the Persian Gulf and the Garden of Eden up to Ur, where Abraham was called from. Ur went up past Nineveh, all the way up to a place called Haran. His father died there. Then he made his way down the Mediterranean Sea into Palestine. He stayed in Shechem and Hebron and places like that. And then through Joseph, they were taken all the way down to the bottom of our map, the bottom left corner, the lower Egypt region. And here they stayed in the land of Goshen for 400 years. They became a mighty nation. And I want us to understand that if they had stayed in Palestine, they never would have come together like they did in Egypt. And if they hadn't been oppressed, they never would have come together as a nation like they did. And so it's this story that helps us to see this oppressed people that now identify themselves as Israel, as the people of God, who are going to find the way that God becomes their redeemer, the one who will save them. And this happens through a man named Moses. If you remember his story, there's a lot going on in Exodus because there's a Pharaoh who comes who doesn't know Joseph. That means has no loyalty to Joseph, doesn't care about Joseph. And he looks around and realizes that the Israelites have become a huge group of people. And if they turned and, and put their loyalties towards an intruding king, they could take over Egypt and he became afraid of them. And so what he thought was, um, let's slow their birth rate. What we'll do is we'll make sure that there aren't any little baby boys being born. And then the little baby girls will marry Egyptians and then they won't be a people anymore. And so he called in the two doulas who were over all the birth of the Israelite children and said, here's what I want you to do. If it's a girl, let it live. If it's a boy... I want you to kill it. And of course, these two women whose names are mentioned in the book of Exodus were pro-life. They couldn't do that. And so the babies kept coming and the Pharaoh called them in and said, I thought I told you to eliminate these children. And they came up with this story about how that the women were so strong and so rugged that the babies were being born before they ever showed up. And it was at that point that Pharaoh said, okay, if you're not going to help me, then I'm just going to make an edict that all the children, the males that are being born will be thrown into the Nile. This is genocide. This is horrific. 
And I want us to see in these early chapters that God rewarded those two midwives for their commitment to life. And I want us to see that because so many times today we ask our question about whether God is pro-life in the way that we think about it today. And I think if you read the book of Exodus, you'll see that he is, that he rewards those who protect life. And so we find in our story that um, people are being told to throw their baby into a Nile, and we learn about a woman named Jochebed who just adores her baby son and can't imagine doing that. But then she thinks, you know what? I can take this baby. I can throw him into the Nile. I'll just happen to throw him into the Nile in a basket, in a basket that's been uh, loaded with pitch so that it'll float. And it's interesting, the Hebrew word, and it tells you this in our story reading, for that basket is the word ark. It's interesting, this big giant ark Noah uses to save the world, and now this little bitty ark Jochebed uses to put Moses in and to place him in the Nile, where Pharaoh's daughter comes and discovers this baby. And I want us to notice that Moses gets his name from her. It's an Egyptian name. It means drawn out. And that became, becomes the name for Moses. But Moses' sister Miriam comes running up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, you've got this baby. Who's going to nurse it for you? And she said, oh, I do need a nurse. And, he, and she said, I know the perfect woman to nurse that baby for you. And so Pharaoh's daughter paid Moses' mother to raise her, to raise him for the first few years. And the word wean in our day, you know, happens early in the first year, but wean for uh, a baby like Moses could have been three, four, even five years old before he would have departed from his mother. And I wanted you to think for just a moment, if you had three four, five years where your child was going to be in your home and then gone forever, how would you use those three, four, five years? What stories would you tell? What songs would you sing? What kind of identity would you try to impress upon your child during those earliest years? so that it would stay with them for forever. You know, I always smile and just know that the most important teaching that happens at our church happens in the youngest of ages. That's where people begin to gain a worldview, begin to understand why this story is so important and becomes their story. And what we'll discover is what Jochebed puts into Moses in those first three to five years makes such a formative impression upon him that he will act on those lessons when he's 40 years of age. He'll still see himself primarily as a Hebrew who lives in an Egyptian palace. And so we begin to see that even Moses' mother is known as a person of faith. Hebrews eleven twenty three 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. And so we find Moses growing up in Pharaoh's household. That's why he would have been prepared to write the first five books of the Old Testament. He would have had a great education. He would have known so many things. He would have known engineering. He would have known philosophy. He would know leadership. And so now we discover at 40, he sees one of the Hebrews being oppressed, and he decides to act upon it. And he kills this one, and it's discovered. And what we discover next is that at age 40, Moses has to flee to Midian. And if you're wondering where Midian is, it's Egypt, Sinai, and then the other side of the Red Sea in the southern part of Jordan. That's called the region of Midian, and he goes there. And it tells us in he uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, by faith Moses left Egypt, 
not fearing the king's anger, he persevered because he saw him who was invisible. And so what we discover is that God took Moses to Midian at the age of 40 because there were lessons that he had to learn. You know, I was laughing with Scott Tillman this morning about the rain coming down on those who are camping. But here's what I know about camping. We camped every month that I was a kid growing up with my parents. We joined a camping club, and it was because James Dobson said that families who camp together experience adversity and all kinds of hardship through camping that, that, <clears throat> that brings them together as a family. And so although I know they've had a difficult time camping today, I guarantee you that those who camp together, who experienced the rain, they'll bond in a way that's really powerful. And what wilderness moments do for us is deepen our dependence upon God. If you think about all the people in Scripture that God wanted to do mighty things through, they went through a season in the wilderness. They went through a time of hardship and aloneness because God teaches us things there. Moses met his wife there. And there at about the age of 80, 80, he goes to Midian at 40. For the next 40 years, he tends sheep in the wilderness. And about the age of 80, he comes upon a burning bush. See that area with the little box? That's where he would have been. It's this area here. I get to take students there uh, on every good year and kind of see where all of this story took place. There's a monastery there. And at the base of that monastery, there's a bush. And they date this bush back generation, generation, generation. This bush has been there since at least 300 A.D. And they argue this is the bush that Moses encountered God at years ago. But here's what it says. Moses came upon this bush that was burning but not consumed, and he heard a voice from God say, Don't come near Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. What God was saying to Moses is, Moses, this is a thin place. This is a place where the separation between God and mankind is incredibly thin. I'm right here with you. And so, Moses, take off your sandals. And then it says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up to the land, a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Do you notice what it says? God says, I have seen, I have given heed, I am aware, I have come down, and I will bring. God is saying, this hasn't escaped my notice, and I am about to do something about it. And then God tells Moses his name, Yahweh. Jehovah is another way that you'll see it. Y-H-W-H. -H. You're probably aware in Hebrew, the words are written without vowels. And so all you have are the consonants, and you and your brain have to supply the vowels. So my name would be S-C-T-T. -T, and you would have to figure out how to put the O in to make it Scott. Not too hard, but W-L-L-M, you'd have to figure out, is William. But you here, you see these Y-H-W-H, and this is the word that God says will describe me. It means the God who is and who will always be. We say, I am. And I think about a year ago, we were working through some material on the names of God, and I reminded you that a rabbi said, the best way to understand God as Yahweh 
is I am what the situation requires. And I really like that. I am what the situation requires. You need redemption. I am redemption. You need salvation. I am salvation. You need to be fed. I am the God who provides. You need to be healed. I am the God who heals. You're lost in the wilderness. I am the shepherd. You're in battle. I am peace. And so we begin to understand God in this way. But it's interesting, at the bush, Moses is going to make five excuses not to follow God. Not to be the one that God uses to make a difference. And I wonder how many times we make excuses in order not to engage in the situations that God calls us to. Quickly, let me just show you those. First thing Moses said is, I'm not adequate for the task. And the next thing he says is, I don't know enough. How are we doing so far? Then he says, I don't think people will take me seriously. And then he says, I'm no good with words. And lastly, he says, you know, I just really don't want to do it. I mean, can you imagine talking to a burning bush that way? I mean, Moses at 40 was convinced he could do anything, and now Moses is 80, and he's not sure he can do anything. And now he's, oh, just send somebody else. I'm not your guy. And God says, no, you are my guy. And Aaron is coming to help you. And so Moses goes, and he returns to the Cairo area at the age of 80 to speak to the Pharaoh. And he says, God says to let my people go. And the Pharaoh says, yeah. And this hardening of heart thing here that we saw in our video, I tried to say to students uh, often that the same heat that melts butter hardens clay. And one of the things we have to understand about God is that he provides the heat to our lives. And sometimes when he does, it results in repentance and our hearts melt. But for other hearts that are already predisposed towards hardness, God's heat only hardens the heart more. And this is what's happening with the Pharaoh. And this is what's happening as these 10 plagues unfold. God is trying to say, you worship the Nile, here's blood in the Nile. Oh, you like frogs? Okay, have some more frogs. Oh, you worship cows? Well, let's put a few boils on your cows. And God is just basically taking what Egypt adores, reverences, worships, and saying, I'm greater than that. And that should be clear to all of you. And we come to the 10th plague, and this becomes the moment that identifies Israel even to this day. What we're told is that God told Moses, tell the people, find a lamb, a spotless lamb, and when you find it, on the right day, at the right time, you should kill it. Drain the blood, put it in a bowl. Then take the blood and use a hyssop branch as a paintbrush and paint the door frames of your house. Now, fathers, can you picture yourself doing this? Go find the best lamb you've got in your flock, kill it, drain the blood, put it in a bowl, and go paint the door frame of your house. And when the kids begin to ask you why, you begin to explain, God told us to do this. There's going to be death and destruction. It's going to come over all of Israel, the firstborn in every house that doesn't have this. That child is going to be killed. But this blood will allow God's death angel to pass over our house. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 16, Moses will, before he goes, remind them that Passover is a lasting ordinance remind them of exactly what this sacrifice should look like and why it is so important to their identity. Jesus, of course, picks up on this, and it's the Passover story uh, that Michael read for us today that helps us to understand 
how Jesus was finding himself in this story as it began to unfold. And so they learned to eat and to remember and to understand that the blood of this lamb was somehow a substitute for the lamb of the firstborn. And God was willing to pass over. The Hebrew writer says it was by faith that Moses prepared the Passover and spread the blood on the doors so that the one who brings death would not kill the firstborn of Israel. And so there's two big questions that we get from the Passover. And I want you to think about these for a minute. The first question is, what did God's people learn at Passover? As you're sitting inside your house and there's wailing and mourning and incredible grief rising up all over Egypt and you're sitting in your house eating bitter herbs, eating the shank of a lamb and realizing that there's something happening outside. What was God teaching his people? And who did God's people become at this moment? I want you to think about that. We know the rest of the story is that they departed. They got stuck at the Red Sea and Pharaoh came after them with his entire army. And I love what happens in Exodus chapter 14 because the army of the Egyptians is coming and they're stuck between this coming army and the Red Sea. There's no way out. If you want to talk about bad strategic logistics, I mean, they're trapped. And what Moses then says to the people is, don't be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring today. Don't you love that? Don't be afraid, stand firm. God's going to take care of you. You agree? That's great. But look at the very next verse. Don't, don't dismiss this verse, but hold this verse with the next one. And the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Put your rod, stretch it out over the sea and divide it, and the children will go through on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So Moses says, stand firm and God will deliver. And God says, why are you standing there? It's time to go. And both of these are true. God in his timing will provide the way for us. And when he does, get moving. Walk in the way that God reveals for us. Clark was asking me about, okay, what route did he take on this uh, Red Sea passing? And here's my, my theological, archaeological answer. I have no idea. <laughs> but there's a few options there, and uh, you can get the map. But here's what the Hebrew writer says. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. They went into the wilderness they began to grumble, and God sent manna. Everybody know what manna means? Yeah. Can you imagine stepping out of your tent on the camp out today, and that's what you see on the ground? What would you say to the person next to you when you saw that on the ground? You'd look at it, and you'd say, what is it? And that's what manna means. What is it but God provides? And so they come to Mount Sinai and they come to the Ten Commandments and Scott Tillman is going to pick up there next week in our story. But here's what I want us to notice today. Moses learned to be a meek leader. Notice I didn't say a weak leader, but a meek leader. A leader who was willing to turn the reins of his life over to God. And say, God, you lead and I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. I am your person. Just tell me what you want. Moses had to learn humility. If it weren't for the struggles, you wouldn't have the strength. 
God is always building you even when it seems like he's breaking you. Those 40 years in the wilderness, D.L. Moody says, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody, 40 years learning he was nobody, and 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. True humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Moses learned humility. God can't use any of us until he's broken us and we have become humble. Jesus' brother James says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The second thing I want you to notice is God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. Moses, I didn't call you because you were all that in a bag of chips. I'm calling you and now I will make you what you need to be. God qualified Moses for the service. And the key thing that God told Moses and Jesus tells us is I will be with you. When you wonder how can I do this, how can I go on, how can I take another step, the answer God says is I will go with you. This Passover becomes the formative moment in Israel. It also becomes formative for all of us who want to understand how we fit into this story that we are proceeding through. And so you remember my two questions? What did God's people learn? Maybe the answer, we have to sing it. <clears throat> there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Isn't that what Israel learned? God did something with the power of the blood of a lamb. And it spared families. It allowed the death angel to pass over. And the second thing that it did is it told them that they were a different people because of what God had done for them. There's a song we sing about that too. It goes like this. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And what Israel discovered is that's what set them apart from every other people, is that they were the ones who had been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And they found their identity there, just like we find our identity there. It wasn't because anyone was worthy, it was because Jesus' blood was being foreshadowed even there, only the blood of Jesus can cover us. And so we ask the question, are we washed in the blood of the Lamb? And then we come to the last of our stories. Isaiah will look back at the Red Sea story and say, when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. You see, who we are are those who realize there's power in the blood, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb and now have passed through the waters and come out free on the other side. We are the people who have passed through the waters of baptism, marked by the blood of Jesus Christ, 
And we have come out the other side as the people of God who find our very identity is that we are the ones who have been covered by the blood of Jesus and who have passed through the waters of redemption and salvation to come out as God's free people on the other side. And so this morning, as we look at the life of Moses in these early chapters of Exodus, what we see is there's power in the blood. We see that we are called to be a people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb, who have passed through the waters and come out as God's people on the other side. If you've never given your life to Christ, I make that appeal again today. You cannot be spared unless the blood of the Lamb has covered your life and allowed God to pass over you. You are not part of God's people unless you've passed through the waters of baptism and come out on the other side identifying with God's people as your salvation, as your victory, as your redemption. What do you need today? Whatever it is, God, Yahweh, He is what your situation requires. And if we can minister to you, that's why we're here. And we encourage you to come to the front as we stand and sing this song together.